welcome to a special edition of Beyond the CCXP. In the next few minutes, we're going to be looking at conversational design. So if you are somebody that builds bots uh, in any shape or form, whether they're voice bots or you know textual search bots or these little bots that you clip onto the bottom of your website, it um, doesn't matter how you build and what technology you use, the... Um, this module, Conversational Design, is really going to be looking at best practices for the design side. So we're not tying ourselves into a particular technology or platform. It's really about understanding the nature of conversation, uh, how to uh, create best practices around building conversations when you're looking at an agent talking to a human being. So let's get started. So for the agenda today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the anatomy of a conversation. We'll then discuss the key conversational moments. Then we will look at designing for scope and topic. We'll look at the idea of intents. And then actually what's going to form the bulk of this module is we're going to look at tips, tricks, and best practices. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look at a few examples of things where maybe bots haven't been so successful. And uh, I'll try and come up with... Uh, different ideas and solutions to show you on how you can kind of uh, work around those kind of things and improve them and so forth. So in terms of the anatomy of a conversation, uh, pay attention to the left-hand side of the screen first. I know there's a lot on this slide. So on the left-hand side of the screen, what I want you to, to be focusing on is a conversation is made up of a number of activities. So these activities could be something like the opening of a conversation, somebody requesting something and then closing it. Each activity will contain a number of sequences. Sequences are very specific things like a greeting, a welfare check, and then an utter a sequence is made up of a number of utterances. And utterances, also known as turns, are just what somebody says when it's their turn to speak. So now if you look at the diagram to the right, this actually um, has been reproduced with permission by Robert Moore. Robert Moore's book on conversational UI design. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. It's a fantastic book that kind of takes the idea of um, conversational agents and conversational analysis and combines them into a pattern language that are, that's very, very useful if you're building your own bot from the ground up. If you're using something that's already out of the box, maybe one of these keyword bots where, you know, if, if there's someone says this keyword, do this keyword, uh, probably won't be that useful. But someone who's working at a much deeper level with uh, natural language processing, I think you'll find his book very, very useful indeed. But essentially, what we're looking at on the right-hand side of the screen here is uh, how he represents a typical conversation. So on the left, you can left column that says turns. You could just read it as if it was a regular conversation going on in a chat window. But then as you move to the next column, you'll see how things are broken down. So you'll see that there's a greeting by each of the individuals. Then someone requests a welfare check. You know, how's it going? The other one responds, going good. That's their welfare report. You have uh, answers. You have requests. You have inquiries. You can see the answers used twice here. You then have pre-closing, and then you have farewell as well. And he's built a whole set of these patterns of these sequences that can be used uh, if you're building your own natural language processing unit. So I thoroughly recommend checking out his book. However, from the, from the perspective of designing a conversation, my advice is just to be aware of these kinds of things that, you know, there is this inherent structure and that is that all of the things you say typically will form a sequence and that sequence will form one or more sequences will form an activity and so forth one or more um, activities will end up adding up to a complete conversation. So this essentially is uh, the anatomy of a conversation and how to think about one uh, when you're designing your, your conversational agent. So now let's look at key conversational moments. So obviously we know that there's an introduction. So that's where the agent should create a strong, positive initial impression, inviting interest and encouraging trust. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, it, I don't really need to say too much more about the introduction. It's almost every culture in the world. This is how a conversation starts off. However, the next point, orientation, the agent should establish what it does and how it can be used. We don't see this in a lot of bots. And this is a key conversational moment. So this is something that you should be putting into your conversational agents. 
normally there's just instructions on how to work with the bot, the kind of things that you can say. Uh, these are what you can do. If at any point you're not, you know, you need to get back to the main menu, say this. Uh, if you want to ask me a question, do the following. It just needs to be a set of very basic instructions that are laid out at the beginning that are easy to follow. You don't want it to be too in-depth, otherwise people just get lost. But it needs to be enough to, as the word describes, to orient the user so they understand how to communicate. Then we have action. So the system should be able to take a finite set of actions to help the user achieve their goals. This is one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge with conversational design is what actions are we going to support? What kinds of requests are we going to support? And I've actually got a really useful um, framework I'm going to show you shortly, which will help you with that. But that's the biggest challenge is just trying to think what, what's actually going to be in scope and what's not going to be in scope. And when you, when, you, when you have something that you know is going to be out of scope, you then need to think about how you're going to respond to that. How do you tell somebody, well, we don't actually support this? And how do you do it in a natural way? So, so that's a key part is to make sure that you have a list of clearly defined actions. And as you'll see with some of the examples that are coming up soon, some of the biggest companies in the world don't even handle this properly. So this is, I think this presentation today is still going to be rather basic. It's going to be rather high level, but you would be surprised at the number of businesses that can more than afford to invest in this arena, uh, how poorly they are doing. So, you know, if you can get the basics right, I think you're going to be, do very well with your conversational agents. There's also a book, uh, Conversational Marketing, I believe it's called, that actually goes into the ROI and the reason why you even would want to have a conversational agent on your website or maybe a voice assistant on your business, that kind of thing. But essentially, uh, they liken it to walking into a store. And when you imagine going to a website and there's just nothing there other than a, you know, a, a form that you have to fill in, you would never get that in real life if you walked into a store. You would never just not be able to get help from somebody and have to fill in a form somewhere. There'd always be someone there standing at a table that could answer your question. So you know, that's, in a sense, what they're trying to do with uh, conversational marketing is to build a representative that can at least handle some initial basic questions. And that can mean the difference between a sale and going to a competitor. The other key thing is guidance. So systems should ensure successful interactions by providing instructions and feedback as well. So um, we'll, go, we'll go over some of that more in some of the principles, but essentially people just need to understand how to use the system and when things aren't working, how to backtrack out something that isn't working and realize their goal. It's all about, I mean, this is kind of like the whole point of design in the first place, is to, you know, to get somebody to their goal with the least amount of friction possible. So now we're going to look at designing for scope and topic. So I kind of alluded to this slide earlier on. This comes from uh, Robert Moore's book, Conversational UX Design, A Practitioner's Guide to the Natural Conversation Framework. Now, even though this is more of a technical book, I will tell you this. I've read, I've read quite a book. Uh, I've read quite a bit on uh, conversational analysis and conversational design. And of everything that I've seen so far, this is by far the most useful framework that I've seen in this field. I would say that if you actually only take away one thing from the presentation today is you take away this slide because this pretty much will give you the meat of everything that you need to know when it comes to the design of a conversational agent. Essentially what you do is you think about what's going to be in scope um, in terms of what the bot supports and then also think about the topics that the bot the will support as well. So there'll be things that are on topic and off topic. And then you make this grid up. And then in each of the quadrants, uh, you will place information related to them. And I'm going to walk you through each of those one by one. So let's start off on the top left. So something that is both in scope and on topic. So this is something that is fully supported and is high priority. So let's say that you have you know, a travel website. Someone saying something like, show me the flights to Las Vegas. This would be a classic example of something that is on topic and in scope. So this is the core of your conversation space. So this one includes specific travel related queries, but be sure to identify the backend APIs and dependencies 
to make sure that they can be answered. Obviously, you might identify things that cannot be answered, which then creates some slight problems, and you have to think about how you can gracefully uh, gracefully degrade from that. Uh, yeah, and there are ways of doing that. We'll talk about it in the principles section. But essentially, this is really where you want to be brainstorming and thinking about all the kind of things that users could, could ask and all the different kind of ways they could be asking it. Um, the, the key is to really identify what the intents are here. So going to our right now, we then have things that are out of scope, but they're on topic. So this is partially supported at medium priority. This could be an example of when does the Neon Museum close? Well, items that are perfectly reasonable for users to ask, but which are beyond the scope of what you plan to release. These should be partially supported. And this means replying with a version of, I'm afraid I don't have information on hours of operation at this time. It's going to take a lot of effort. You might be moving things between you know, the, uh, the, the top left and the top right columns. But essentially, you need to nail this down. You need to be really 100% sure on this. And your user testing will inform this as well. And you may even change your mind after your user testing. But it's very, very important to understand in terms of everything that's uh, on topic, what's going to be in scope and going to be out of scope. Now we have things that are off topic. So we have something that's off topic but is in scope. That means it's supported, but it's low priority. So that could be something where someone says, tell me about yourself. So items that are off topic for a travel site, but you've decided to support. In this example, asking the agent about itself or your company. If you create any kind of mascot or character, that kind of thing, it's always a good idea to give it a backstory. Um, personality is an interesting topic when it comes to this space. There was some research done recently, and it showed that adults really don't care, to be perfectly honest, but children like personality. So it depends on your who, who your bot's going to be interacting with. But if it's kids, then I would say you want to pay a lot of attention to this bottom left quadrant in terms of developing a personality and a backstory for the agent. Then finally, we come to something that's off topic and out of scope. So simply put, this is unsupported, it's low priority, this could be some random thing like where was Lord of the Rings found? So, you know, inevitably a good brainstorming session will generate some utterance pairs that are neither on the topic or in the scope of your application, and these simply will not be supported. You need to obviously come up with, you know, a, some kind of a reply that the bot will say uh, to explain that this isn't supported or it doesn't understand. Uh, you obviously want to have some kind of response. I, I had an interaction recently with a very large company where there was no response. I'll show you that in the example section, but that was very, very bad. So you want to make sure that, yeah, you're always – you can think of conversation like a tennis match. When someone says something, it's like they hit the ball and it comes to your side of the net. Well, then it's your turn. You know, your, your turn to hit the ball back. And so you always want to make sure you're doing that. Otherwise, the person just gets completely confused. So now we'll talk about intents. So once you've kind of figured out, you know, what goes to, into each of those uh, quadrants, you'll want to think about the different ways of saying them as well. So you might have an intent around booking the flight and you might want to have an intent around booking a room. Well, then you need to think about all the utterances that can make that up. So uh, let's, say you're using, um, let's say you're using one of those pieces of software where you can do it by keyword. Well, I bolded the keywords here. Uh, so that, that way you could program it simply by using them. So if someone says, I want to book my travel, I want to book a flight, I need a flight, plane flights, that kind of thing, then you would be able to code that keyword to the correct response. Uh, likewise with a hotel, I need a hotel room, book hotel, I need accommodation. Um, natural language processing, the way that it typically works, is when we build these up, we... Uh, it's just, a, it's just really counting words uh, in, a, in a given category to try and find which is the most likely. What, what do we think the person's actually asked? Sometimes people might ask for things that are similar, and the categories are similar as well. Um, you know, you might there might be a company website, and one of the things might be, do you have any uh, information about uh, employment opportunities? Um where should I send my resume? That kind of thing. So that could be one category. Um, but then likewise, you, know, you also might have a, 
Another category is asking about the employees, like how many employees do you have? Do you have an employee in charge of this? And you could easily see how that could get blurred. And so that's why the more examples when you're building natural language processing, the better. However, if you're coming at this from a high level, you're not coding it as such, you're just going to use a tool, then really it's just a question of uh, once, you've, once you've followed the quadrant exercise that I showed you on the previous slide, it's then a question of just trying to find the right keywords. Because uh, this stuff doesn't have to be rocket science. So now we're going to look at a whole bunch of tips, tricks, and best practices. So firstly, people are less interested in speaking with conversational interfaces in public. So that so there's an element of social embarrassment and awkwardness. Uh, people become very frustrated when having to repeat information aloud to a voice agent, especially when it does not interpret the information correctly. You've probably seen people going, operator, <laughs> operator, you know, they get really fed up. And it is embarrassing. We all hate that. Uh, but sometimes people don't necessarily consciously think about that in the design. I don't know why. There seems to be such a great gap sometimes between designers and what happens in the real world. So this is a, definitely a best practice. For a phone, a voice agent, consider giving the user an option to use touch tone. So they don't have to say operator. They can just press zero. Uh Tips, tricks, and best practices number two. Uh, voice questions tend to be about 40% longer than typed questions. So when using a voice agent, people tend to formulate their questions such as if they are actually talking to another human. Conversely, when they are using a textual agent, uh, the questions and searches are formulated with more brevity. So designers of voice agents may need to guide users on how to ask questions that can be understood and answered. Um, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to tackle that. But if you can't, and there's, there's a lot of complexity in there, then you're just going to have to zone in on one part of that and then ask for clarification. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the only way around that. Um, or you do what the, what the recommendation here is, and you basically say, here's kind of the rules of how I engage, and can you ask your questions this way? Tips, tricks, and best practices number three. Uh, children use voice agents differently to adults. I think I touched on this earlier. So children's, children prefer agents with a personality. Uh, children don't care if the agent remembers their name or not. And so in mixed environments, so this is where you've got adults and children together, the family will often take turns using the system or help each other out when there is a misunderstanding with the agent. Uh, conversational interfaces should repeat back what they've heard when there is an error. Also, um, I don't know if they're getting to the point yet where they can detect different voices, but when they do, that will need to be a design consideration, is that just because a different person's talking, it doesn't necessarily mean the context of the conversation has changed. It might just mean one person was struggling, and then a, another person decided to get involved. The studies that were done showed that when a conversational agent didn't understand what a child was asking, uh, the child would try on an average of three more times and then just give up. And when they tried those three more times, they used a variety of different strategies as well, either repeating the question, uh, changing some of the words around, adding words in, taking words out, that kind of thing. So best practices number four, users are most frustrated when they do not understand why there was an error. And intent misclassification is the biggest cause of these errors, Conversational designers should be mindful of utterance patterns that could lead to misclassifications. So what you are seeing on the right-hand side of the screen is, is an example that comes directly from myself. This really happened, happened last week. I logged on to Zoom. I knew I was going to be doing a lot of training, so I wanted to upgrade my account. So I had more recording space in the cloud. I looked around, couldn't really see where to do it. So I went to the bot and I said, how can I upgrade my account? And it didn't do anything. I didn't get any kind of response. I waited for a little while, um, still nothing. So, uh, so I thought, okay, so I just typed hello just to see if the bot even was getting my messages. And it responded immediately back, hello. So I thought, okay, he's getting my message. So I asked the question again, no response. And this is Zoom. I mean, this is crazy. I don't understand why there was not some kind of a response configured, you know, even if it was for something they've never seen. Personally, if I was working there, upgrade would have just been a simple keyword where I probably would have just 
provided a link uh, as a response that takes you to a page that tells you how to upgrade your account. And I'm surprised at Zoom because most businesses, when they build their conversational agents, they normally tend to focus on themselves first. So they're always looking at answering questions on how can how can I upgrade my account? How can I buy more? How can I bulk purchase? So very surprising. But anyway, this is a real world example. I wanted to share it and uh, just goes to show you how shocking the, uh, the standards are these days. Although to be that being said, I used Amazon's bot. Amazon's bot was just amazing. And it actually, it changed my mind. I used to be someone that was big into natural language processing and I've moved into someone that prefers menu-driven bots now because the experience was so good. Number five, advertisements are coming to voice search. This was new to me when I was researching. I'd never even thought about this. So the research that was done shows that interactive ads are more memorable than non-interactive ads on voice search and ads that use a unique voice and are relevant to the user's interaction are the most memorable. And this is really where you can inject a little bit of humor and a little bit of personality as well. But maybe maybe someone goes on their Amazon Alexa and they're asking for, do you have the opening hours of, I don't know, like... There's some Halloween, I can't remember the name of the store now, Spirit of Halloween, I think it's called. And they all open up, you know, at the end of the summer and you go in and borrow your Halloween. Someone's maybe asking what the opening hours are. And maybe someone's then attached a uh, ad for a local haunted house. And you can imagine a voice actor trying to sound like Vincent Price comes on and makes some ghoulish claims. And, uh, you know, if you... Uh, if you uh, use this discount code when you arrive, then you can get an extra person in to scare for free, that kind of stuff. It, it can just be a lot of fun. And you, obviously, people are going to have to be very careful with uh, voice search because uh, those advertisements can become quite irritating after a while. But like most things, people will find a way to screen them out when they're not interested, when they're in a very goal-oriented mode. Um, but I do see how if they're relevant and you've got that unique voice, how that certainly could be much, much more engaging and effective. So number six, use a human for a beta release or a controlled test. So this will allow your bot to have graceful degradation if an utterance appears that you had not accounted for, while still allowing your designers time to account for it on the final release. You know, they'll see the transcripts come in, they'll see where your human took over and handled the situation, and they can build that in. It will also allow you to see if there is anything else that you did not plan uh, without having to find out in a live environment. Now, context catches many designers out. So if you're using natural language processing, it is a key to account for context. Great example here, you know, how may I assist you? Oh, I lost my credit card. I'd like to bot the card, please. The first thing they say is, that's great. So again, not really accounting for the context of what they're talking about. And uh, it obviously cause a very bad customer experience. Okay, best practice number seven. So there is a place for humor. So obviously, if your bot is handling a serious subject, like giving out advice to cancer patients, then of course, humor is not appropriate. However, in an emotionally neutral context, uh, the beginning and the end of a conversation are generally the best place to inject humor. Uh, this advice comes from Erica Hall, the uh, author of a book called Conversational Design, published by A Book Apart. And um, she says uh, that basically uh, the beginning and the end are kind of like when all the serious stuff is done or not happened yet. So that's where you can literally put them in and it shouldn't detract from actually solving the problem. Uh, in 2019, several people were interviewed about conversation in general as well as conversation agents. And they expressed that humor is a key part of human conversation, of good human conversation. And it's not necessary for a bot, but it can be a nice novelty. When I said emotionally neutral context as well, uh, another example would be, uh, imagine someone wants to go on a food ordering website. Well, the, uh, you, the most likely thing is that if someone is on a food ordering website or using a food ordering bot, they're probably hungry. So that means they're probably wanting to get, to, get stuck in and just get it done. So... That kind of context I would not call emotionally neutral. Even though hunger really isn't an emotion, it's still going to be frustrating for them if you start popping up jokes and stuff. So 
uh, you just need to really consider the state of mind and the state of body that a person is in when they're likely to use your, your uh, bar. Okay, tip number eight. The agent, the agent should signal the other person's ten, turn by ending with a question or instruction. So turn taking will make the conversation easier to manage. To enforce this, developers will need to lock the input box so that the bot has time to respond. If the bot responds quickly, this should not cause too much of an issue with the user experience. However, as you can see in the example here, the bot hadn't come back, the input box wasn't locked, and it ended up causing a whole bunch of confusion, and the bot ended up doing the wrong thing. Uh, so turn taking is a key component of conversation, and repair should also be built in for misunderstanding. So you need to think about areas where someone might say, no, 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 that's not what I meant, I didn't want that, and then repair should be one of those sequences that you can activate so that you can remedy any bad situation. You need to enable the user to understand using as few words as possible, uh, so only elaborate if necessary. So what this means is that when you are developing your responses to uh, the utterances that would come in from the user, you should, you should maybe do two versions of it. One should just be a minimal answer, and then one should be an elaborated answer. Um, one of the key tenets of a good conversation is to communicate minimally. So make your contribution as informative as is required, but do not make your contribution more informative than is required. So you give them what they need, and then if they need more information, then you've got the elaborated version of the text. So in interaction design, offering just what's needed for the task at hand is called progressive disclosure. Okay, tip number 10. If the agent needs time to process, it should be able to provide a signal it is doing so. So for example, Alexa has a thinking queue and it's not actually broken. So you recall from my example, nothing happened, you know, and I wasn't sure if it was broken or not. If it had a thinking queue I was used to and I didn't see that, then I would realize that actually it wasn't doing anything and I wasn't waiting around for it. And this can be as simple as a message to basically say to the user, can you just please wait? Okay, tip number 11. The agent should validate input before using it to take an action that's difficult to undo. Now, in general, it's not recommended to give bots the authority to carry out these kinds of activities. There's always been a timeless tension between customer experience and security, and there probably always will be, and it's about finding that right balance. But if a user changes their mind and the input is easy to undo, it absolutely should handle this. You can see in this example here, the bot saying, do you want to order or or for delivery, uh, the person saying I want to pick up, and then they give them some more information at that point, the person realizes it's not going to work for them and they can't backtrack out of it. So this would be a classic example of where that needs to be designed in. Tip number 12, consider offering a menu of options rather than an open text input so you can mistake proof an online form. So first of all, solve for the smallest number of choices that will satisfy the customer intent depending on where they are, if you think about them going down a uh, like a flow diagram of different options and things that could happen, whether they say yes, no, or choose an option. Uh, no one with a goal in mind wants to know the full range of possibilities, uh, so, and menus may not seem conversational, but they're faster and friendlier than bad guesses. So for example, uh, you know, someone goes to a, a flight website and you might ask them where they're flying from, um, or maybe someone goes to a food ordering website and you ask them for you know, what zip code they are. You know, that narrows things down a lot. They don't want to see all the restaurants in the country. They just want to start off with as minimal much of information as possible. So the more you can narrow that down with the right questions, the better. And that's why I really like the menu approach. Like I said, Amazon did a great job. They, what they've done is they've done the research to think about what are the most, what are the most common things people ask for, and then they built that in. And then, of course, if it was something that didn't fit into that list, then you could go to a human. But the key was the bot was designed to handle most of the common issues that come along. So number 13, computers should do all the information storage and retrieval in the transaction. So human mem memory is fallible. Humans will get frustrated if the computer expects them to remember something that they know the computer can access. It comes across as lazy on the part of the developer, and the developer has failed the human if that ever happens. So when I went to Amazon, I went there because I needed to return a damaged item. 
The first thing it did is it said, what are you here for? Return a damaged item was one of those things. I clicked that. Then it came up and it said, uh, was it either of these orders? And it gave me you know, three or four of my most recent orders or, or not. And then I think I said, I said not. Then it gave me a few more. Was it any of these? And I picked it. Then it went through and asked me some more questions. Well, if at any point it said, uh, could you could you remind me what the item was again? Or can you can you type in what the order number was? No one remembers order numbers. That's why I get so frustrated when I phone up these uh, bank lines and the, the person's like, what's your what's your account number? I don't know. I can tell you the last four on my social, but I, no one memorizes long numbers like that. So. Uh, and that's just that's not even talking about bots. That's just talking about regular customer service. So anyway, uh, you know, make sure that the computer does all of the information storage and retrieval. Number fourteen: If your conversational agent is a fictional character or a brand mascot, you should have knowledge of its backstory. I think I talked about this earlier. The key really is if you don't craft the personality intentionally, one will be assigned by your customers. Uh, but you don't necessarily need one as well. Adults don't really tend to care about that kind of stuff. Um, the key really is just the speed of service and the ease of service. That matters a lot more than personality. Number 15, provide a way for the user to get a resolution if the conversational agent is unable to help. So do not design dead ends. Look at this example here. Person's going through, everything looks like it's working quite nicely. Then they get to a point and the bot can't help them. It just gets stuck. It's like the bot's spitting out the same thing over and over again, stuck in a loop. You've got to provide a way for users to speak to a human agent. When the, um, when the bot does its orientation at the beginning, it really needs to list out how that can happen. So if at any point you're not happy, type this to speak to you. I would recommend zero because zero is what most phones use as well when you phone up the, uh, it, it, the interactive uh, voice channels. Um, if this is not possible, Provide a way for the user to leave a message that the human can follow up with. So maybe it's you know 3 a.m. and it's not business hours. That's fine, but just pop something up so that they can leave a message. Number 16. You might be able to refine your bot's interaction design by using the Pareto principle. So you might find from testing and real-world deployment data that 20% of your in-scope utterances end up accounting for 80% of all queries. If this is the case, you can refine your bot and possibly even move from a natural language processing system to a more efficient menu-driven system. The Pareto principle, and uh, I recommend you look that up, is uh, something that we see all throughout the world. Um, let's say that you're someone who's a developer, you're writing code, and there are different types of error that can pop up in the code and you categorize each of those out, normally you'll find that, that there's 20% of those categories end up accounting for 80% of all the bugs. It's very strange uh, the way that you'll see it, and you see it all the way through life as well. Um, go Google Pareto Principle, do a little bit of research on it. Uh, I don't have any specific further reading for it. It's pretty straightforward, but it wouldn't surprise me if you find something like this. And it's not always 80-20, but it's close. Tip number 17. Conversational metrics enable us to see which sequences are the most widely used and successful. Now, this depends on you know, how far you want to go down with the metric side and the data side. But if you're ver very interested in really making this experience fantastic and putting the right amount of effort into the right things, then these are two metrics you can use. There's the sequence completion rate. So this is the percentage of initiated base sequences that were completed by the recipient, agent or user. This is closely related to the level of mutual understanding, one of the key goals of conversation. There's also interactional efficiency. So this is the measure of how much extra work the user or the agent had to do in the conversation. So what we can do is compare the theoretical minimal number of turns for a given query, the actual number of turns in the conversation to get a measure of the rate of the interactional efficiency. The final thing I want to talk about here is that you must test the bot with real users. Uh, you know, I can't stress this enough. I've got a cautionary tale here for you that we're going to look at shortly. It's the 2018 BBC story of Wiser and Wobot, and they tell a cautionary tale. So let's have a quick look at that right now. Okay, so here we are on the BBC website, and uh, 
you can see the headline here, uh, child advice chatbots fail. Um, I can't read certain things out because this is YouTube, but you can see it on the screen. Um, but basically, uh, we're going to go through the article here. So it says here, two mental health chatbot apps have required updates after struggling to handle uh, reports of certain kinds of abuse. Uh, neither of them told the apparent victim to seek emergency help. The BBC also found the apps had a problem dealing with eating disorders and drug use. The Children's Commissioner of England said the flaws meant the chatbots were not currently fit for purpose for use by youngsters. They should be able to recognise and flag for a human intervention a clear breach of law or safeguarding of children. Both apps have been very suitable for children. Now, this is terrible. Why has it had previously been recommended as a tool to help youngsters by an NHS trust? It was released in 2016 and claims to have been used by more than 400,000 people. Its developers have now promised an update will soon improve the app's responses. Wobots makers, however, have introduced an 18-plus age limit for their products to resolve the probe. Now, let's, uh, let's go down a little bit and have a look at this. So, Wobot is designed to assist with relationships, grief, and addiction, while Wiser is targeted at those suffering stress, anxiety, and sleep loss. Both apps let users discuss their concerns with a computer rather than a human. Their automated systems are supposed to flag up serious or dangerous situations. However, in a series of experiments, they failed to identify obvious signs of distress. The BBC used that, this following phrase, which you can see on the screen here. It's also here. And Wobot said, sorry you're going through this, but it also shows me how much you care about connection. And that's really kind of beautiful. So terrible, terrible responses. Um, when the tester added they were scared, the app suggested rewrite your negative thoughts so that it's more balanced. The BBC then altered its message to become, I'm worried about uh, being pressured into things. I'm 12 years old. The time, this time the response included, maybe what you're looking for is a magic doll to adjust the anxiety to a healthy adaptive level. So basically a total failure of the chatbots in a very serious situation. Wobot did not warn, sorry, Wobot did warn that it could not help with abusive relationships, but it only did so once when a relationship was first discussed. Turning to Weiser, the BBC texted the same, the same thing and the app responded, you seem to be doing well overall, but are struggling with a few problems right now. Um, it suggested reaching out to a psychologist before posting an animation of a cartoon while one of the words keep swimming. So anyway, uh, there's some more stuff that you can uh, you can read here, uh, but basically uh, just a classic example of uh, really really bad failure of bots. Admittedly, they were taking on a pretty complex subject here. What probably would have been better is outlining at the very beginning of the interaction what the bot did and what it did not do. And, you know, if you have encountered any of the following things that we don't do, please do the following, you know, seek help from a professional, uh, speak to a psychologist, those kind of things. Um, that would have been something that would have been more pertinent, but should have happened in the design phase. It shouldn't have got this far. So anyway, I'm not going to lecture these people because we all make silly design mistakes, and that's the whole reason we have this conversational design discipline now, is it's very important to get this right because you never know the people that are using your bots, you never know their psychology. And it's very different from just a search form or a website because it's interacting with you and we have that inbuilt nature in us to anthropomorphize things and make it feel like it's a person, even though we know it really isn't. And uh, there definitely is a level of connection there. So there's a level of responsibility to get right. We need to make sure that we do it correctly. So so that's what I would say as far as this, uh, this example on... Uh, on these two chapels. And that concludes today's presentation from Beyond the CCXP on conversational design. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Uh, the best place to get me normally is on LinkedIn. Uh, but I do want to remind you that um, Beyond the CCXP is a new initiative I'm setting up. Uh, essentially, if you want to gain your CCXP renewal credits so that your CCXP is good for another two years, um, I offer a package where you can just get a whole bunch of different training. Uh, you'll be part of a community as well where you can request different types of training that you're interested in. And I'll release another one or two every month so that by the end of your two years, you are completely renewed. 
and uh, you haven't had to digest a whole bunch of material at once. You know, it'll be nice and paced out and tailored to our users. So uh, if you need any more information, please head over to beyondccxp.com. Oh, 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 oh,